Welcome everyone. My name is Katherine Gianni and I am the Assistant Director of Public Relations for Boston University's Central PR social media team. I want to welcome you to the second Spring Strategic Communication Series event. Today we're welcoming Howard Manley, who is the Race and Equity Editor at The Conversation. He has a number of slides that he's going to present today and kind of walk you through what The Conversation is, best practices for some um, kind of research uh, in engagement and promotion and how to sort of collaborate with the conversation team. I do want to make a note and emphasize that this event is being recorded. So we will definitely be sending out a recording at some point next week to all registrants. Um, additionally, we have our contact information in that follow up as well. So if there are any additional questions after this event, please feel free to get in touch with our team um, or Howard himself um, on the editorial side. So with Without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Howard to introduce himself and kick off this presentation. Thank you. All, all right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I welcome everyone who's uh, decided to join uh, this afternoon. Now, I will tell you in advance, I'm not a technically savvy, but we're going to try to move along with some of these slides. And then I'll look forward uh, afterwards to, to having your questions and I can feed uh, or feel, give you uh, uh, just a sense of what the conversation does on a daily basis. So without further ado, there's the conversation at BU. And I will say that I worked in Boston for 20 years. So I'm thinking of Commonwealth Avenue and Fenway Park as we're talking. So, all right, uh, I'm not, uh, okay, there is. So our mission, uh, you can read here, uh, is to bridge the gap between the academics and the expertise and the scholarship with a mass audience. So as we've seen over the last six or seven years, it's just a lot of folks just don't know basic things that we try to explain and we try to tell. Uh, the conversation started in Australia maybe 10, 12 years ago, and has got branches all over uh, the world, uh, Canada, uh, the UK, uh, Africa, um, and Brazil, I think. So yeah, it's a wide reaching organization and its footprint is fairly large for a small staff. In uh, this, uh, and we could get into to this a little bit more, uh, the best thing, like I say, we want to do is, is have public service. So whatever field discipline that you're in, there's some reason that you were interested in it and guaranteed because of your interest and passion for that particular topic, you will be able to write about it in a way. And I always like to tell people, write it for your cousin at your family barbecue. Just break all these things down, make it nice and simple. And that's your takeaway. So folks tend to understand things. We don't tell them what to think. We do help them how to think about uh, different issues of uh, uh, of the day. Um, you know, the articles, again, uh, are distributed through the Associated Press and a lot of other organizations pick us up. You've probably seen or read uh, conversation stories and did not notice the sort of credit that's on it, but it's a, it's a, from small newspapers to Google. In fact, there is this one little amazing fact in all the news organizations in the world, in the world, uh, the conversation is number 17. So that's right up there with the New York Times, CNN. So exposure is one of the good things, especially for those all, uh, uh, scholars who've written books and want to sort of get that out there. Um, the good thing um, are these conferences, uh, and I'm sure most of the editors uh, at the conversation enjoy the conversations that they have with scholars. Uh, it's a good back and forth. It's a good collaboration. Um, academic writing is not the same as journalism, but we can sort of meet in the middle on 90% of the stuff. So we want uh, the focus is on the access to the information, the public service. Um, informing the citizenry. So um, uh, that's across the board with all the deaths. So let me stop sharing because it makes me nervous when I'm running the bus here on the uh, the technology. So, all right. All right, yeah. So uh, like today, uh, you got a crazy day. You got OJ Simpson passing away. You got the first trial of a president starting on Monday. There's a lot of scholarship in between all of those things. So um, 
I just like to open the floor up to any questions, to uh, any story ideas in particular, and we can sort of uh, hash them out and get going. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the raise hand function. I can call on you if you'd prefer to include in the Zoom chat. Um, that's also totally fine. Also, Howard, I did receive a few questions um, prior to the event. So if we want to kick off from there, but I see that Brian Kellum has a question. So um, go ahead, Brian. Hello, everyone. Um, my question is about um, how um AI is changing the landscape for how news is disseminated um in terms of results coming up in like search engines as being AI generated um how people are moving away from Google um towards um platforms like perplexity and if your organization has given thought to those sorts of ways that search and notoriety and the use of the internet is changing thank you yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Now, again, that is above my pay grade, these technological questions, <laughs> but there is a department that does just that, everything. And here's how it affects the writing. Like even from the headline to the length of stories, all of that is factored into who can pick them up and how they're transferred across the net and across platforms. So uh, we can, I can circle back with you on that question and get a guy to really answer that. But no, they have a whole technical thing that are very good about that. Uh, yeah, so that's a that's a big, good question. But again, above my pay grade, I'm I'm in the weeds about what you want to write about. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Um. So just turning to the chat right here. Um. Somebody asked, should I understand that the conversation discourages an argument that convinces? Is that what's meant by explanatory journalism? Um, could you elaborate a bit on that, Howard? Yeah, argument is good. Conclusion is not good. So instead of an op-ed where you say, this is what you should do, or this is what you should not do, we're not, we, we try to sh shy away from that because it, it, it can be advocacy as well. So we like to play that down the middle. We give you the data. We give you the facts. Here's what happened. Uh, and here's the context of this. Um, and you can sort of make an argument pro and con. But again, we we try. And again, that's in the case by case basis. But those are the kinds of words that we do not like using, which is you should do this. You should not do this. You should think this. You should not think that. Um, and so persuade. Uh, and here's the other element to this is that there's a tendency just to say that this happened. You wanna show what happened. So you wanna walk readers through uh, what you mean by all these words. And that sort of paints that full picture that uh, gets more access and folks uh, making a conclusion based on your facts. So yeah, that that's always a complicated question, um, but, but yeah, we will grapple with that as we see fit on an individual basis. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, over to you. Hi. I uh, have been doing research on uh, notifications to women about their breast density, which have been sent out with mammogram results for about the past 10 years. And last year, the FDA uh, finalized a federal regulation requiring that kind of notification in every state in the union. And the research that I've been doing has been documenting that women with lower health literacy, women of color, um, women with fewer resources and so forth, understand the notifications less and they are more often alarmed and confused. And um, so we we think that there's some um, disparate outcomes that have been coming out of the notifications required by the states. So we gave the FDA a lot of feedback about that, and they did listen to us. They made a very simple notification, but I I'm I'm doubtful that they really fully tested it, and I remain very concerned that women are unduly alarmed about their breast density and they don't know what to do and. In addition to that, the underlying 
the the fact that these notifications are occurring is the fact that the science base is inadequate to really guide healthcare providers as to what they should recommend women do. And this has all been driven, this, the notifications has all been driven by women uh, patient advocates who um, were diagnosed with breast cancer after having um, so-called normal mammograms, but they had breast density that obscured their tumors. And so ah, well okay, there's the link. All right, yeah, yeah. But, so well-meaning advocates got this all in place and now it's happening, even though the science <laughs> doesn't know how to guide people. So we've written a bunch of papers and that's fine, but I, it's such a complicated issue. I sort of think it might be a good thing for the conversation, but do you agree? <laughs> it, oh yeah, it's an excellent story. And, and when you have these complicated things that people 90%, like the assumption in academia is that people know this stuff. People do not know this stuff. So when you say breast density, I have no idea. All right. So the way you could format that story. Now, our health desk is flooded, but they're good. They're very, very good at that. So you can search what we've done, if anything, on that. But the way to frame it uh, is the five things you need to know about notification on breast. You know, we'll work with you on that. But the five things you need to know. So the first thing is, what is breast density and what is its link to X, cancer? The second thing is, the science is unresolved on this. The third thing would be, the notifications are failing to reach the people they're aimed to sort of help. You know, and then the fifth thing is, here are some recommendations the FDA is taking them under advisement or whatever it is. Um, and that's the public survey. Here's the five things you need to know about that topic. And that's a good way. And, and again, you only have 800 words. Okay. Maybe a thousand. <laughs> we might let you go 1100. I don't know. <laughs> you see, it all depends. But if you format it just right, that's one way to look at it. And then cut the complicate. Again, you're talking to your friends at the barbecue. What do they need to know? And then... So that, that's a good one. That's a good one. So what would be my next step? Would would it be Your to draft step, something or or what? Well, okay. The next step would be to get it commissioned. So you have to do a pitch. Okay. All right. So you got to go to the pitch portal. Uh and and again, you want that and then and they have a format uh on it, uh, which has, you know, what's the the, the story in a nutshell? What's the relevance of it? Uh, and your qualifications to write it, and, and we can walk you through that. Uh, but you want to just have three or four sentences that summarizes the piece and, and as close as you can on a headline. You know, that's what I'm saying. The five things you need to know about breast density. People are going to read that story just because there's the, you have no idea what that is. All right. So, uh, but, and then the help desk can take it, uh, and, and again, everybody's swamped, but they'll get back to you and, and get the story going. And then, so in the meantime, knowing that that's a story, uh, you can start working on it now. You know what I mean? That, 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 that That's fine. Because it's hard to get a story down to 8,000 uh, words. Yes. You know, it's easier almost to write 5,000, you know, but <laughs> getting it down. And that's why the points helpful they're very very helpful what would be the questions that your cousins had at the barbecue and hear the answers okay thank you yeah yeah no problem at all that's a good story tells people something they don't know that's the whole mission of this right um selma and thank you nancy for that question selma i see you had your hand raised Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I also have a really interesting research that I like to write about through the conversation. Good. My dissertation was about immigrant physicians and refugee physicians serving underserved communities in the U.S. and also around the world. Um, I'm a recent graduate. And, you know, when you submit to journals, you're always sort of wary of rejection and all these things. And so I looked at the conversation and I just read about the pitch and everything and I guess I'm still kind of hesitating because I want to pitch very well. 
And uh, well, what are the what are the okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let me uh, like, say this. Okay. Yeah. So someone saying like, oh, you're not allowed to write. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the pitches serve a couple purposes. One is a specific story that you have. Another is to introduce you to different editors at the the conversation, who, depending on your discipline, will will sort of get you in as a scholar that could potentially write about X, mm -hmm. right? So they're important, but they're also not the end. If you don't, if if the if the editor doesn't like that particular story, don't let that stop you, you know, because mm -hmm. there's other stories to do. And and I thought where you were going was the uh, immigrant physicians that work in underserved. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Right, right. So it's really interesting that you know the visa system in the U.S. is very difficult to navigate for for immigrant professionals, for immigrants in general, right? So there is a paradox in the U.S. where there is a need for immigrant physicians. We're already having a third of them uh, in the American workforce are foreign trained, but they come up against these visa structures where it's really hard to get uh, a work visa. A lot of them come in on student visas, and some of them, depending on country of origin, are stuck in the green card backlog, and they went for 10 years sometimes before they can get permanent residency. So they come in and they serve these communities but this visa uh, problem stands in their way for them to kind of rooting themselves in their communities, for them to feeling comfortable and have, bringing their families here. So there is this intersection between healthcare delivery and a broken immigration system. Perfect. So that way we can tell this larger story of just the mess of immigration mm. through the, the, the good people, doctors, who want to come over here. And in fact, there's a third of them already here. Mm -hmm. but they have this problem with the visa. So the story then is what is the problem with the visa and how can it be fixed? Right. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. So that's a definitely pitch that. And then to <laughs> that one, you got a healthcare delivery angle. You also have a race and equity editor. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. angle. Uh, and so we got a couple of people on politics that, that sort of deal with that. So yeah, no pitch away, pitch away. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's kind of interesting. Huh? Don't be bashful. Don't be. Okay, bashful. I won't be bashful. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was kind of choosing between like, oh, is this just really important, or is it a newsworthy hook? And like, because those are options when you pitch, like it makes you kind of pick, like, is it yeah, something that happens now? Or yeah. So the thing about news, news to a certain extent is what you say it is. Mm -hmm. So if you say this is a problem, and it is a problem. Uh, then because other news organizations don't have it, doesn't lessen your story as new. That's mm. you have. That's a good story. That's a legitimate okay. good story. Send away. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the way it works, so the, you send in the pitches, they come in, and depending on uh, whether it's a health and science or how you word it, it'll come to the politics desk or it'll come, mm -hmm. but we all look at those pitches very carefully. And we mm -hmm. always sit around and try to figure out how to make them work. Mm. Uh, so it's not like we just reject it. No, we, you're not like journal editors. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, We're just we want the story. See, that's the partnership <laughs> part. You know, we want to get yeah. it so that, you know, you can do not only for the conversation, but we, you know, to get, a lot of our writers end up being interviewed. They end up doing interview. You know, it's just, it's a good thing. So we're here to make it work. That's what we're here for. Excellent. Thank you so yeah. much. That's very encouraging. Thank All you. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, moving on to Nicholas. I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much for making the time for this. This is super helpful. Um, oh, no. I'll ask from the perspective of somebody who had a pitch rejected a couple months ago and try and just ah, ease, like keep shooting, like, right. keep shooting. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, but but maybe learning about how to how to do it maybe a bit better for next time. Um, so I had a question about that newsworthy hook because basically yes. the, my co-authors and I had a couple of papers around um, farmers like in developing countries that are facing climate change and how they're ah. trying to cope with climate change. And we wanted to make a hook to like, there's been a lot of farmer protests around the world recently, like in India and in Europe. And so we wanted to make a hook to that, but we also, you know, we wanted to be careful and not say like all these protests are exclusively due to climate change, right? So we wanted yes. to make this kind of nuanced hook. Yeah. Um, and the feedback we got was like, you know, sounds interesting, but maybe not, maybe it's a little like the, the thing that we were pitching was a little bit too niche and, and not like broadly newsworthy enough. So I guess the, the question I would have is like, 
when you have something that could tie into a bigger news story, but maybe isn't like, you still want to be careful, right. About like not overblowing kind of your tie. Like, like, do you have any kind of advice for how to, how to yeah, do that? Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, protest, farming, protest. so the first thing is, that, you know, in the, in, 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 in our, you gotta, it's in the context of a 2024 presidential election. Mm -hmm. So how does it impact the United States? That, that's the first prism you got to look at. You could argue that Biden's climate change bills and laws sort of lead the way. And maybe you can sort of shoehorn that in as a way uh, to tell the larger story that, you know, the overlooked aspect of Biden's climate change is how he's dealing with farmers. And I don't know, you have to sort of hash it out. But when you once you start talking about world protests, now you get into international and 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 you like I say, you're at the barbecue with your cousins. They want to hear about what the farmers in Nebraska got to say about corn, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then you got to explain what the protests are. And that gets so yeah, you got to reshape it to a, and so you're looking for an angle in the U.S. to talk about this, and that may not have come up yet. Yeah, that's a great point. We haven't thought about that angle. So a quick follow-up on that. If I have co-authors yeah. in Europe, uh, does it matter kind of where, like, how do you advise, no. like, which conversation? Uh, no, 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 no. And and they're all different. We call each other cousins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they have different things about each one of them. But no, uh, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Yeah, okay. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I'm interested in farming and and the rural because of the race. So if you want to circle back with me and we can kick it around a little bit, uh, I'll be glad to do that. Glad to do it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Barnett, you're the next hand I see. Sure. Thank you. Well, a uh, number of things. One, if you're at a barbecue with my cousins and you can get a word in edgewise, good for you. Um, two, two, um, for the, <laughs> thank you. Glad to, glad to see we have the same family. Um, but I, for the 800 words, do you ever run a series? Uh, for example, I'm doing a lot of work on the effects of artificial intelligence in the capital markets. I can certainly reduce it to 800 words, but it works yes. better. It works better to have components with that. Is that something you'd be interested in? Uh, yes. Now, there, again, there's there's technical things about that. In the old newspaper days, you could call it a series that are coming out in the next four days. And the Internet world is a little bit different, but it also is an opportunity. So, yeah, that story would be to the business desk or maybe our technological guy, uh, Eric uh, Smalley, who's very good at that stuff. Uh, so I would definitely pitch it and just say, um that there's three or four separate parts to this story. And yeah. if they're unique enough with the same theme, that can work. That definitely yeah, can work. Yeah, as, as you can imagine, discussing the capital markets is a rather broad statement. <laughs> right. So you have to first explain what capital markets are. Then you got to, you know, you got all that. And, yeah. uh, and then you have all this noise in the background. What does it mean to me? I don't have any money. It's like cryptocurrency. I don't know. I, I don't know what that is, you know. So, sure. but no, that would be a good one. So I would definitely try to pitch it. Good. No, absolutely. Thank you. And the, the final question is, and someone had touched on this earlier, where else do these stories get picked up? And when something runs through um through the conversation, do other news yes. Uh, and, and where and where do you see that happening? And it's a broad question. You cover a lot of different things, but what tends to float their boat? Oh, okay. So uh, it's the range of everything that's out there. So from CBS News to CNN to Scientific Magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, Washington Post. It's the rain. Any the the Kalamazoo Gazette will take these stories. Uh, and as an author, you can go to your dashboard and see exactly how many hits and how many places and where it's being read. Uh, so yeah, uh, all the majors, Yahoo is a big driver. Google is a big driver. Um, Apple, they got all that stuff, man. It's just, uh, it's fascinating. 
And do you keep track of where I don't mean to dominate this? I'm sorry, I just yeah, didn't line. I don't want to occupy other people's time. But do you track where those are going? Yes. Uh, or where the contacts are? So yes. You, instead of waiting for it to come in, you can do outreach. Oh, yes. We have a team, the same team that do that out. So, so we have a relationship with the LA Times, for example. Okay. So if we're doing a story that's particularly interested in, in that particular uh, area. We'll give them the heads up and then they'll get like a little deal to be able to run it first and, and, and nobody else. But again, um, yeah, no, it, it's proactive. They're very, very aggressive about that, but not to the point of being annoying. Sure. And I'll close with this. I promise. Um, but that's for print media or for internet print media. Mm -hmm. Do they ever reach out for on camera work or, or. Oh or yeah. Yeah. You definitely will be getting called. Yes. Yeah. You okay. definitely, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you nice. get calls for interviews. Uh, you, you know, every news organization has their Rolodex of scholars on this particular topic. Bang. There you are. We right. see that happening all the time. We also see, uh, stories in the conversation help folks get research grants mm -hmm. and you can use it as a part of your marketing tool to say that I did a story in the conversation and they got a uh, hundred thousand hits or whatever that is. So yeah, no, it's win-win for everybody. Got it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No that. problem at all. And I'm looking forward to going to the barbecue with you. you... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Barnett. Um, we have another question from Nancy in the chat. She writes, what is different about pitching to the conversation versus national newspapers for an op-ed? Uh, again, I, there's not that much of a difference, except an op-ed may want you to have a particular opinion about a particular topic. Uh, we, we tend to gravitate to those that want to keep it with the data and the research base. So, you know, uh, it, it's either way, but it, a lot of times the stories that we run are published in the op-ed section of the newspaper. So that causes a lot of confusion too. But um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. And because you got to present the argument one way or the other. Great. Uh, uh, um, a question that I was curious if you could expand a little bit more on Howard is what the collaboration process looks like between academics who are pitching to the conversation and the specific editors from one of the sections. How hands-on are they when it comes to that writing process? And um, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what that might look like. Well, sometimes I'm going to bring you into the sausage factory now. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, you know, it's word by word, comma by comma. I mean, is we're going at it. And, uh, the review process is rigorous. Uh, so you'll submit a draft. Uh, the, the first editor, say in my case, you would send it to me and I'm going to go over it and make sure, you know, we got links and all that sort of stuff. I'll put the photographs in and all that. And then once we're sort of good at that initial round, I kick it upstairs. And then you have a second round of another level of editing, which edits my edits. And then you got this whole, so there's always some questions after that. We get that resolved. Then we got to kick it up to the third floor and they take a look. And usually they're not uh, as vested as the first two editors, but they, they're they going to look and they always will have a question. And at that point, we're all good. I kick it back to you. The authors always have the approval. We cannot run a story without your approval. And that goes back to, if you don't like the headline, you can say something about that. You know, so it's your story at the end of the day. Um, you hit that approval. And then there's the, the final level of editing, which is the copy editing, making sure all the links work and making sure we didn't, you know, uh, just say something out absolutely crazy. So, and then it's published the next day or the, the that moment. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a strenuous, rigorous. I consider it fun. Some people consider it, uh, you know, just, it's just awful, but it, you know, just go in mind that uh, that that we're going in. You know, it's it, it, it's not an easy. It's a hard thing to do, but it's it, it it's at the end of the day, it's it's well worth it. 
Absolutely. Um, are there any kind of common mistakes or things that you see either when it comes to the pitching process or maybe that collaborative um, process with academics and editors, things that maybe you've encountered in the past or maybe some of your colleagues have mentioned um, as sort of things not to do when approaching the conversation? Yeah, you want to get right to the point. You know, what is this story about? So if you have a uh, this story details this problem you know you want to be especially in the pitch process that this story is about this you really want to spell that down the easy way to think about it is the five things you need to know if you have troubles with that those are the kinds of things in the pitch process that uh, uh, are helpful to the editors and get right to the point once you get past that and you're writing a story you, it's almost the reverse of academic writing in that I usually can go to the conclusion of an academic piece and then make that the first paragraph. So all that buildup uh, to get to that last point is just reversed. So, and of course, shorten and tighten. Um, so uh, that is one thing, getting right to the point and then show and don't tell. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did an ex uh, a story on uh, the anniversary of jo a story that uh, uh, I get forget the guy's name, uh, the TV Edward Murrow did on Joe McCarthy, and the author had said Joe McCarthy was a powerful senator. All right, so you're just telling me that he's a powerful senator. You can show me by saying that he sat as chairman of such and such a committee and held. 28 hearings and called 175 witnesses and da da, da 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 that now you're showing me that he's powerful instead of just telling me that he's powerful you can say trump is a corrupt individual but you can show me by saying he's been indicted in four different cases the, that little thing and again, the assumption that people know, do not, they don't know. They just don't know. So acronyms, avoid them. You know, like I say, the, the process is the process, but it's, uh, those are some of the things that are helpful in the editing process that you sort of thought about. And, and you don't, and you want to tell me a story. Tell me a, with a beginning and a middle and an end. You know, don't forget that the end, so I used to tell people, like, I, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher, so I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, right off the bat, you want to hit them with what this story is. Second paragraph or second section, you want to tell the relevance of this, why you should care. The third section, you want to have a little pro and con. This is a good thing because of this, you know, go back and forth. But in that last section, you want to be that Baptist preacher that brings it all home. This is my takeaway. So that's the chance to say, as close as you can to not having an opinion, here's your takeaway from this. So, um, yeah, it's uh, again, every editor is, is different, but that's generally the way our stories are. Great. Thank you. That's very a very helpful breakdown. Um, I'm seeing another question from Nancy in the chat. She wrote, you mentioned links. Is that to references or supporting documentation? Yeah, the links are you want to support every statement that you can. So especially if you have research, you want to use the DOI. You know, you want to link to your own research. You definitely want to do that. Uh, and on our platform, it's the same with the little link chain to, to, you know, you define it, bang, you got, but you definitely want to do that. If you have a book on a particular topic, you just don't want to gratuitously throw it in. You want to say that in my book, you know, such and such was there. So you can reference, I mean, link to your book. Um, so yeah, your links are your uh, footnotes and work those in. So you just don't say in his, Ernest Hemingway in his book, da, 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 say why it's important, work it into the text so that you can see why this book was important to the point you're making in this story. So use that because there's no footnotes. We don't do that. No, 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 no. But the links can sort of do that and the way you structure uh, uh, 
the paragraphs to say where this stuff came from. Yep. Uh, a bit of a follow-up question to that. Is there a sweet spot in terms of um, how many links are good to include? Um, is it the more the better or do editors? Yeah, think... for every point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you you want to link it up now. Uh, it doesn't have to be every word or anything like that. But, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, you definitely want some links. And that's helpful to the readers because now they can go and do what the internet does best, which is let you go down a rabbit hole and do the thing. So that's a helpful way uh, to get the readers to go even further into uh, a particular topic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, turning again to just a few other questions that were asked prior to the workshop, um, a researcher who was asking, I guess, their focus in on some more abstract issues in the humanities, and they were curious for recommendations if um, they have a more niche subject matter that they have an expertise in, what's a good way to kind of frame being more appealing to a broad audience from your perspective? Well, uh Irregardless of what or niche it is or how uh, 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 small a demographic that may be interested in this field, people want to read about people. So say you're a philosopher and and and, and you want to write about uh, you know a great you know Plato. If there's an anniversary, the hundredth birthday, the fiftieth anniversary of this treaty, uh, whatever it is, if you can put human flesh on difficult and complicated questions and issues, that's very helpful in telling a story. That's what we're doing. We're telling stories. You don't, you're not going to get it all in a thousand words. You're just not. But you can get a hell of a story in 800. You really can if you keep it nice and tight and how does it affect everything has some kind of impact on people's lives everything so remember the humanity and even it's almost like the reverse so the more complicated the more human that that makes any sense yeah no, that's a, a great recommendation. Um, someone else was curious about any research priority areas or topic priorities um, that you or your colleagues might be thinking about this year. Um, maybe it's political related, uh, maybe it's related to technology, AI, like are there any topics that are really um, something you're thinking a lot about right now? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the presidential election, uh, the, uh, the court cases, AI is huge. I know at every news meeting, there's some AI story that's coming up. Uh, health in general, post-pandemic, they're, they're flooded over there. Those are good stories. And, and the big story is the money. You know, why is it when you go to the grocery store, paper towels, I got to make a small damn loan to get. So how is that possible? Yeah. But, you know, those are, the, I mean, just what you think it is, that's what it is. You know, what, what's on people's minds at the barbecue? You know, what are they talking about? They're talking about how cost of living is. We haven't even got the rent. We haven't even, but those are the sort of big areas. Uh, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, any anytime you can tell somebody something they didn't know is good. So mm -hmm. don't let all the news of the day. In fact, a lot of times you got to turn the news off. And you want a story that tells you something. Just can we just get a good little story, you know, where you you know it doesn't have to be slamming somebody or some problem. Just a nice little story, you know, where a problem got solved. Right. Uh, and if you are a faculty member, a researcher who's focusing in on one of those topic areas that might be a little bit more saturated, or they um, folks are receiving more pitches around it. Do you have any recommendations in terms of how to really stand out or maybe take a slightly different approach to one of those topics? Yeah, it depends on what the topic is and what the angle is. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of times, again, uh, just because we've done a story does not mean we don't want to do another story. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of these areas, and, th and this is where the, 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 the uh, my friend at the barbecue was saying that you could do a series. So you know, the confusion and dysfunction of the U.S. House, for example, 
we've done lots of stories on that lots of stories on that because it's never ending and so um send the pitch anyway and like i say there's a you know and don't let that be a negative experience it's just you took a shot it, that one didn't work shoot the ball again because there's always something new uh and don't be afraid to use your own research and how you got into a topic to tell a story so say you are a bioethicist and you became interested in something you can write about that and walk people through your interests and why this is important to you and to the nation at all so we don't do a lot of eyes based stories, but you can walk us through some, especially if you did something unusual, like you spent three months in the Antarctic looking at penguins. First of all, we can run penguin pitchers. Who doesn't love a penguin pitcher? And then you can talk. So, you know, be creative in that sense, you know, start with yourself and then why you got interested in it and then it broaden out to that because that may make a good story as well. Sure. Um, and you're talking about penguin pictures, which kind of makes me think about other visuals that might accompany somebody's research. Is that something that your team is um, always aware of? Is that something you're looking for? Any graphs or other visuals? Yeah, we we have our own sort of internal uh, graphics department. So whatever the data is, we can turn it over to them and then they'll shape up a graph and all that sort of stuff. Unless there's something like if you're that uh, professor that was in the Antarctic with the, the penguins and you have some unique pictures, uh, uh, we can find other pictures as well. But that becomes a problem when it, on the copyright issue. And so say a newspaper wants to run it, they don't want to have to go and get a copyright picture from you. And it's just, that, that just creates a problem. But that's a case by case basis. And yeah, we always think about how to illustrate a story. Yeah, right off the bat. Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure we're giving everybody the opportunity to um, use the raise hand function if they want to, or include any follow-up questions in the chat. Um, Howard is more than welcome for folks who logged on a little bit after three, more than able to chat about specific uh, research niches or other questions you might have pertaining to a specific uh, pitch or idea. So please feel free to, to raise your hand or include anything else um, in the chat just as we um, get a little bit closer to four here. Um. <laughs> oh, okay, so. Oh, Nancy, yeah. So I, I'm trying to understand the difference between putting something in the conversation and putting something in the op-ed section of the Washington Post. And I think I'm 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 hearing that the conversation publishes pieces that show the complexity of an issue and don't necessarily end up with a should statement. I mean, you said that last yes. part quite clearly. And yes. so it, it, is is that first part accurate that showing the complexity is the uh sort of the main goal of a piece yes. of the conversation yes yes yeah here you know getting your bringing your expertise to a particular problem you know uh that's why yeah yeah that's where we want to stay in that realm just hear hear the issues hear the details around those issues um yeah and again it's a it's you know, it's a shifting sands when it comes to that. There's all kinds of, even the adjectives that you use, we would try to make sure that those aren't leading in any direction or not. So, um, but yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right on that. And especially in that story that you had, you know, you definitely want to show, you know, just because it is complicated. So walk us through those complications in a simple way that makes it accessible. And then, and let other people, because you've done shown them what the problem is, and that, and leave it leave it at that, leave it at that. Now again, you know, you'll go through the conversation, you'll look at different stories, and say, "Hey, that, there's an opinion," you know. <laughs> so no, it's not a, it's not concrete. You know, we're dealing with written words, and so shoot away, shoot away. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Nancy. 
Um, Howard, I'm also wondering, you know, is there one main takeaway that you would like to leave everybody with today based on all the great information that you presented? One kind of one key insight or thing that folks should think about when they're sending in their next pitch or they have their next collaboration opportunity? Yeah, here here's the one thing. And, and I've been a reporter the majority of my life and have always called scholars at different universities and you're scribbling your notes and all that sort of stuff. And you may get a quote, maybe two quotes this way. You're in control of the story. You can tell what and show what is important and your take on a particular issue. That's the takeaway because to get experts as opposed to just crazy people talking about all sorts of stuff, that's the mission of the conversation is to inform the citizenry to be responsible citizens. And whatever piece of that puzzle you have, bring it. We can't have academics on the sidelines. And, you know, so uh, that's the big get in the fray, get in the fray. And it's not, you know, it's not on us that we didn't try to do explanatory journalism. Uh as accessible to all. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, for everybody's reference, I've also included Howard's contact information in the chat, um, just in case you want to get in touch with him directly after this presentation. I will also mention um, that our office, uh, the public relations social media team, we oftentimes work with faculty and researchers to help kind of guide them through the pitching process um, and go over different potential ideas for conversation pieces. So I will include our email alias um, both in the follow-up with the recording of this event, as well as in the chat right now. It's pr at bu.edu. So if there's ever um, a opportunity that you want to collaborate with the conversation or you want to just kind of go over some ideas with our team, um, one of us, myself included, would be happy to get back with you and discuss it further. Um, so again, included that email there and I'll include it in the follow-up with the event recording as well. Um, we have a question. Oh, go yeah, ahead. I just saw this about the arts. Yeah, that's huge. I, I mean, there's so much arts and culture. I didn't even, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please, I mean, please just, that's huge. So yeah, I mean, we try to stay on top of all that. Yeah, you got all that going on too. So yeah, yes. <laughs> Yes, definitely. It's it's wonderful the the wide range of different editors and topic areas that you all are covering and focusing in on. So I feel like there really is a fit for um every researcher within the university yeah. to kind of find their find their opportunity. So great. Uh, um well if anyone has any last minute questions or Howard, if there's any last things you feel like you weren't asked about that you want to share. Yep, just bring it, bring it along. This has been very, very good. And I'm really excited about getting some BU folks in, in into the conversation again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I, we'll wrap up um, a little bit early. Thank you so much for logging in and for your time. And we'll share the event recording um, at some point next week. But as I mentioned, if there's any follow-up, please feel free to reach out to me or to Howard as well.